So I'd like to introduce our first uh, panelist tonight, which is Dr. Alex Lord. Alex is a senior lecturer at the Department of Geography and Planning at Liverpool University. His principal research interests relate to the economics of urban policy, particularly experimental economics, game theory, and the impacts of regeneration initiatives. He has completed projects funded by the UK government and the European Union. Alex is the author of The Planning Game, published by Routledge in 2012. He also knows, as I know from conversations, a great deal about quality of life indices. Alex. Thank you, Jerry, and uh, thank you, John, as well. I should begin by thanking you uh, for what was a really um, interesting and, and candid account of what the, um, the Economist uh, um, Intelligence Unit produces. Uh, for my part, I've been asked to give the, the first response uh, on the basis primarily of uh, methodology, of um, what The Economist does and also what rival indicators uh, produced by other agencies uh, seek to produce with respect to quality of life and, uh, and livability. However, I'm fairly sure it's not really uh, the appropriate forum for a, uh, an in-depth statistical discussion about metrics and so on. So I'll try and confine what I say to um, three main observations which might provide the platform for a, uh, a wider non-technical uh, discussion. Uh, so firstly, I think I should probably acknowledge the, uh, the power of what the economists do. And in the production of uh, a, a league table, they do something which uh, many agencies do in a whole variety of different uh, formats. So there's probably not a parent in the room who isn't aware of the, uh, the local league tables of schools or the area that I work in for the university uh, here in Liverpool. Well, you know, there's a global rank of universities which uh, is produced and has a really fundamental and almost mesmerising effect on students. It really does. There's a lot of research that suggests it has a really significant bearing on where students choose to, uh, to study on the basis of a, a, a league table. Uh, the reason I draw attention to that is because what John and the economists do is much more complex than just simply reporting A-level results or GCSE results. It's a, a composite index, as he's presented today, of a whole series of variables that seek to try and get at a, a qualitative understanding of what it's like to live in a particular city, covering the entirety uh, of the globe. But the thing that remains common is that format, is the production of uh, a league table. And the reason I draw attention to that, or I'd like to draw attention to that, is because it's a really stark way for the popular press and for, um, for other agencies as well to try and communicate something which is a, an objective truth, or what purports to be a set of objective truths. Um, it then subsequently, as John mentioned, goes on to have a second life when it gets out into the, into the public domain and is used by politicians and so on. Um, and as, again, as, as he drew attention to the, the fact that what the economist produces is not an account of where the best cities are, it's an account of the, the places that are effectively least bad to your chances of leading a secure and uh, comfortable uh, existence. But that doesn't stop how it's used. It is used as John quite candidly pointed out, by politicians to, a, to provide almost a, a kind of third party endorsement of what they do. Of, uh, here's this, uh, this agency that provides us with objective, independent account that we can then harness to make political capital. Uh, so I think it's important to point out that that's a, a clearly a, an outcome of the format within which the data is presented, uh, presenting it as uh, a league table. A uh, second point I'd like to make is that um, it might seem a bit superficially obvious, this, but livability rankings essentially describe the state of affairs that they're statistically predefined to report. Uh, so that's a, a rather convoluted sentence, but so an analogy might be appropriate here. So we all probably in the room know how the, the Premier League is calculated. It's a, an aggregate of points allocated, or awarded rather, um, accumulated over a given period, over a football season. It's quite crude. One point for a draw, uh, three points for a win. Um, and it results in a, in a league table, it results in a, a ladder. Um, we could perhaps adjust that, I mean, it's nowhere near as complex in that sense as what The Economist or any other agency that's trying to produce livability indices produce. Maybe we could adjust it a little bit then. So if we were to perhaps make an adjustment on the grounds of fair play, who's accumulated most points most fairly, then we could perhaps deduct a number of points at the end of the season for um, red and yellow cards. Or we might be interested in something different. We might be interested in who's accumulated the most points on the basis of overperformance, who's done better than they really should have done. So we could perhaps statistically forecast where a 
team should finish on the basis of previous performance or taking into account the level of endowment, the resources they've got. I'm a bit of an anorak, so I looked into that before today, and uh, I found out that um, half the room will probably be pleased to hear that if we were producing a league table of who should have won the league on uh, the accumulation of most points accumulated most fairly, that would be Liverpool, which they probably should have won anyway, but that's another story. Um, the other half of the room, of which I'm a, a, a constituent, um, will probably be it's good news for us too. So if we were looking at who performed better than they really should have done on account of their... Uh, endowment of resources and where they statistically might have finished on the basis of pre previous performance. Well, that was um, won by Everton, by Roberto Martinez at Everton. So we could make small adjustments to an index that would superficially, at any, at any rate, mean that we could all portray ourselves as a, as a winner on uh, some level. But obviously we're not all winners because the official league table says that Man City won. Uh, albeit with a relatively poor disciplinary record and a, a level of uh, <laughs> a, a level of resourcing that would mean that any other outcome would have represented an underperformance. But that's uh, another story. So, but the point I'm trying to make in a rather flippant way uh, is that it's the same story for many league tables. The reason the ancient universities top university league tables, it's the same story for why um, the Zurichs and Vancouver's and so on top city livability indices so often, not just in the case of The Economist, but by Monocle and Mercer and others as well. Um, that's not to say that um, Manchester City aren't a very good football team or that um, uh, Ivy League colleges in the United State, States aren't ex excellent universities or that Zurich isn't a lovely place to live, just rather that it shouldn't necessarily be such a surprise that that's the outcome because that's the way the indices, that's the way the statistics are kind of privileged in that fashion to produce. Rather, it's just a kind of caution to say that we need to be careful to make sure that the league table that we produce is the one that we're interested in looking at. I'll try to keep it brief, so I'll just make one more very quick point, uh, which is that some rankings of livability turn on survey days. They turn on trying to establish a qualitative understanding of how individuals who live in a place uh, view it. And obviously that's a valuable thing to know. But in Liverpool, we've lost half our population from its high point uh, at some point in the last century. So for us, perhaps it might be also instructive to know how livability is perceived from outside. It may well be different for a long-term resident than it is for somebody prospectively looking to move there. And I know John mentioned um, expatriates as part of the way that the uh, economist uh, um, indices are produced, and that's true for Mercer and others as well. Uh, so just to put that a bit more clearly, all, all I'm saying again is that we need to be careful that the index that we're looking at is reporting what we're interested in finding out. If we're interested in repopulating somewhat, attracting people back in from elsewhere, then we might be interested in finding out what people outside the place think of it rather than necessarily what people within it think of it. Uh, so just to wrap up, I think what The Economist does is really valuable because uh, it draws attention to something that we, we probably all intuitively know is true and we probably all instinctively use on the... On the uh, you know, fundamental decisions about where you live, what neighbourhood you live in, what city you live in, uh, and so on. But I have to kind of give the, the sort of disappointing academic caution to that, which is that it's not as simple as any one index could uh, ever ultimately provide. Uh, and I know John will probably say the same thing. So um, there are circumstances that um, where it applies very well, perhaps, there are others where it doesn't apply so well. There's some variables that can be picked up. There are others for which there's no data. Uh, and obviously the, the, the the person at the end of the chain of this is the, the policy maker or the citizen who has to try and make sense uh, of all of that. So I should probably pause there. Sorry. Can we thank Alex for that presentation. <laughs>